Now, I'm almost ready to introduce Derek if Derek is ready to join us. He joined Reed in 2014. As a cell biologist, he subscribes to the mantra, seeing is believing. You may hear some yabbits to that. His research is focused on cytoskeletons, which gives cells their shape and allow them to move. He specifically studies the cells of fruit fly embryos to explore how the cytoskeleton is regulated and developed, as well as cell motility. Derek identifies that, quote, our understanding of how the cytoskeleton is regulated is fundamental to our knowledge of how immune cells combat pathogens, neurons make connections in our brains, or how cancer cells migrate during metastases. Outside of that, not a bit important. Today, Eric will provide a lecture about the revolutionary advances in the field made possible by cell imaging and microscopy and their applications for his research and teaching. Derek, thanks for being here, wherever you are. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. We were having a little bit of difficulty with Zoom, believe it or not, I can't believe that's happening. Um, but let's, we'll try again and maybe, um, <laughs> oh, I think I know what happened. Okay, great. Maybe we can um, rectify that. Do we see? Yes. Yes. We do. Great. And then if I do this, how's that? That's dark. Ah, that's it's great. Working. It's working. Perfect. Okay, great. Screen. Okay. Excellent. So, okay, great. So, um, I kind of tongue in cheek um, titled this advances microscopy by seeing is not always believing. Um, and so I hopefully that will make a little bit more sense as we go through the rest of the day. Um, I'm kind of gonna be talking about a primer microscopy. And mind you, I do teach two weeks of microscopy to my cell biology students. Um, and so you're gonna get two weeks of microscopy in about 20 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, We'll talk about specifically what does super resolution microscopy mean, which is a new um, kind of a new player in the field of microscopy. And um, it's been around for maybe three or four or five years now, but um, um, it really is fundamental to how cell biology is advancing. Um, we'll talk about total internal reflection microscopy, which is the type of microscopy I use in my lab. Um, and then I will, if we have time at the end, I'll talk about the specific research that we do in my lab. Um, and I'll talk about a specific project called um, investigating the role of the F of SPECC1L, Drosophila homolog split discs, in the regulation of non-muscle myosin II contractility. That is a lot of words, and I fully understand that. But if we get to it, I will hopefully break those all down so it doesn't seem so daunting. Okay, great. So I think the first thing I kind of want to address so that we're all kind of on the same page is why is microscopy so important to modern cell biology? I mean, if we go through the lists of Nobel Prizes, which you can, for better or for worse, what are the most important advances in the scientific field? They're often awarded Nobel Prizes. So we go through the list of the Nobel Prizes. Uh, starting in 1925, we have the first Nobel Prize specifically for microscopy awarded um, for the ultra microscope, which we no longer use, but phase contrast microscopy is the type of microscopy we use regularly in my lab. Electron microscopy is another type of microscopy that um, is still currently being used. We can go through the list of Nobel Prizes and we can see that all of this time, we've still been making advances in microscopy. So it has been with us as long as, almost as long as cell biology has been with us. Um, and this list doesn't include the Nobel Prizes where microscopy was essential to the research. So microscopy is super essential to how modern cell biology is performed. And even as, early, as late as, well, as recent as 2017, there was yet another Nobel Prize awarded for advances in cryoelectron electron microscopy. So this is just, it goes to say that microscopy is still advancing. We're still learning how to better the technology. And with better technology comes better discoveries. Um, and so why is microscopy so important? Well, um, if we were just to have the human eyes and no other tools, this is about as small of objects as we can see. So there's a frog egg on the right of that arrow. And on the rest of the arrow is basically the rest of <laughs> the cellular world, which we could not actually see without a microscope. So for cell biology, um, you have to basically, you know, be able to see these objects. And, and this is what my microscopes do. I um, mean, we're quite limited without these tools. Um, so what is a microscope really? Um, 
and it's really a device that controls light. Um, if you break down a microscope, all it is is a device that controls light. That's the most simple definition of what this thing does. Of course, it does increase magnification, et cetera, but really what it's doing in even increasing magnification is just controlling light. Um, and of course, then if it's controlling light, what is light? Well, light is you know, all around us, but it, um, light can be explained both mathematically and physically as both a wave and a particle. Some of you might be familiar with physics. Um, and light has very various qualities which can be used in microscopy. Um, so I know that you're muted. I'm gonna ask you to mute, just unmute for a second. And um, after you think of this question, so what are the ways light can be interact can interact with an object? So you didn't really realize you were going to a lesson that's interactive, but I'm gonna ask you, what are some of the ways that light can interact with an object? It can be reflected from the object. Exactly, reflected. What else? Absorption. It can be absorbed. Uh, Absorption, exactly. What else? Refracted. Refracted. <laughs> Defracted. Defracted. Refracted. <laughs> Refracted. Refracted. <laughs> Okay, mission. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you're all on top of this. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so I think we covered almost all of these bases, right? So light can be transmitted or goes through an object. It could be reflected. It could be refracted. It could be diffracted. It could go through absorption or it can do scattering. And these are all really important concepts when you're talking about a tool that is used to control light. Um, and the most important way that light interacts with matter is actually through diffraction. So diffraction is the spreading of the light that occurs when a beam interacts with an object. So if we go back here, there's a little picture of diffraction. You can see that the light is spreading around that, that pinhole. And diffraction is just basically the spreading of light that occurs when um, light interacts with an object. And so why is diffraction the most important concept in microscopy? If you bear with me, this very simple setup of a microscope, we have a source of light, which is the star. We have our, our, we have our cover slip. We have a, a, a cell attached to that cover slip and we have a, an objective. So this is a very basic microscope setup. And so when we, um, the, the, there are two major sources of diffraction in microscopy. Um, number one is the sample itself. And number two is the objective. So when we hit a sample with light, the light is going to um, hit the sample and actually diffract around the objects inside the sample. And that's really key. It is bending around uh, proteins and um, organelles. Um, it's bending around the membrane, the nucleus, all these things light is interacting with inside the cell. And that light that's interacting with the cell is carrying with it information. So at this point, the light has been transformed from being is a wavelength of light to being a carrier of information. And so the second point of uh, diffraction in this system is the objective. So what you can't see in this is that there's a little hole in the objective where the light will actually enter into the objective into the microscope system. And so like that little pinhole in that diagram I just showed you, light's gonna bend around that pinhole um, and be diffracted yet again. And so the light is being, the light that is carrying information is going to be diffracted back through the pinhole of that objective and into the microscope. And so the whole point of the microscope is to recombine that image, the diffracted light from the sample back to make your image. So if light passes directly through an object and is not diffracted or absorbed, it is invisible to, my, to the microscope. And this is the principle that microscopy is built on. So we actually need that light to diffract in, this, in the specimen and then be recombined in the objective after it's diffract yet again. So light is transformed into energy in the, after it diffracts with the specimen and then is recombined in the objective and then to make an image. So what this means is that the image of an object in a microscope is a result of a diffraction pattern. It is not an image of say a cell, it is a diffraction pattern of a cell. And this is my first point and kind of the point of my first slide of my in intro slide is that you can't always believe what you see because we're not actually seeing a cell. We're seeing a diffraction pattern of a cell. And with that knowledge, we know that that can be manipulated by the microscope in ways that we need to understand so we can understand what we're looking at. 
So I, I, this is just really key point is that you're not looking at the image of a cell, you're looking at a diffraction pattern of a cell. And so what does a diffraction pattern look like? So it's made up of, this is a diffraction pattern of a whole bunch of really bright beads in a gel. But what the beads do, they're kind of sort of singled out in this gel. And we can see I boxed a um, diffraction pattern. This is a diffraction pattern of, of, a, of a, a single source of light. That's what it looks like. And we have a couple of things in this, in this image. We have, this is called an airy disk. So essentially a object is made up of millions of these airy disks. And that's what we're seeing when we're looking at say a cell crawling across a uh, field on a microscope. And we have orders of light. So this is the zeroth order, first, second, and so on, depending how many rings we get. And the dark spaces in between are known as the minima. So the diffraction pattern of a, a single source of light forms what we call an airy disk. And you can think of the airy disk as the units that make up the image that you're actually looking at when you're looking at a microscope. Is everyone, well, everyone's with me, I hope. <laughs> Again, that was probably a week and a half of lecture material right there. Um, so no objective or microscope can completely eliminate the rings or reduce this to a single spot. That is just physics. There is no way around that. The physics of light, we are bound by the principles and governs, govern, of, governed by the principles of physics on this planet um, and probably on this universe. And so we cannot actually get around that. They're always going to have rings. You're always gonna have a single point of light like this. No way around it. So if we were to flip that 2D that this 2D object on its side, it would look something like this. And here we're kind of mapping the light intensity. And so it looks like a peak. And you can see that most of the light is in that zero order, which is that giant peak. And then you can see there's a little peak on the side and then, and so on and so on and so on. And all those peaks after that get to be smaller and smaller and smaller. But this is the diffraction pattern of a single airy disk. Um, and we can actually describe this mathematically. Um, D, which is the radius, equals uh, a factor of 0 0.61 times lambda, which is the wavelength, divided by the numerical aperture. So lambda is a wavelength. The 0 0.06 is just a factor. And then numerical aperture is basically the ability of an objective to gather light. So that's going to change. Um, numerical aperture can go up and down depending on the quality and, this, and the magnification, the type of uh, objective you have. But that will describe the, that's the mathematical equation for the single point of light that makes up all of the image that we can see. Now, some of you might be thinking ahead, wow, well, we can actually manipulate some of these numbers to make that pattern small, right? We really want the smallest diffraction pattern as possible. That's gonna help us with re resolution, which is my next point. So we need to know if we're observing two things or one thing. Um, and so that, so resolution, basically we have two, different direction patterns together, the one A is said to not be resolved and B is said to be resolved. And this again is important because if we're talking about something that's subcellular really small, do are we looking at one structure or two structures? Because that's kind of important. Um, and so this is kind of a very wordy, mouthy um, uh, definition, but it's when the center of the zeroth order, remember that was the majority of the light of one diffraction spot coincides with the first minimum, that was the first dark ring of a second diffraction spot, the two spots are said to be resolved. So that's why in A, we're getting those spots are not resolved. We cannot determine whether there are two spots or one. Whereas in B, those spots are resolved. Okay, so we want to get the smallest possible diffraction spot because that will give us the best resolution. You can understand now why if you have a really fat, really big diffraction pattern, it's gonna be harder to tell if you have two objects or one. If you have a really small, um, very tight diffraction pattern, it's gonna be easier for you to tell whether you have one object or two. So hang with me, I hope, I hope this is starting to make sense. Okay, so if, now we can start to see if we put a whole bunch of these airy disks together. Now you can start to see the beginnings of an image. Um, and you can see that some of these spots are resolved and other of these spots are, um, are um, at the resolution limit. So another important factor in trying to understand and trying to make that diffraction pattern the smallest possible is wavelength of light. Um, 
you know, we, we um, our human eyes operate in a very narrow um, band of this electromagnetic um, uh, path of uh, wavelengths where visible light is between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. Um, other organisms um, are lucky enough to see outside of that, but we are limited by these um, wavelengths. That's just biology. Again, can't get over, over that right now. Um, so this is what we're operating. Um, and so electron microscopy, luckily, um, is another way to sort of get around this. Electron microscopy, of course, doesn't use light. It's losing electrons. Electrons have a very, very short wavelength. And again, if you go back to that equation, you can see the shorter the wavelength, the smaller the uh, resolution. And so the, the size of the airy disk. And so with conventional light microscopy, the type of stuff that you see all the time, we're limited to 200 nanometers. That means that two spots that are closer than 200 nanometers, we cannot doubt if they're one or two objects. Two spots greater than 200 nanometers, we certainly can. Um, and for comparison's sake, if we're losing electron microscopy, that goes down to 0 0.002 nanometers. So there's a big difference there. But the thing with electron microscopy is you're hitting an, uh, a uh, cell with electrons. So that cell is, has to be dead. We can't look at live cells, right? Electrons will destroy the cell. Um, and this cell in particular often have to be treated really harshly so that the, that the cellular structures can withstand being hit by electrons. So while electron microscopy is fantastic and we can learn a lot about it, it does limit us. We have to have thick cells that have been treated with harsh chemicals so that they can actually refract the electrons and withhold with, and withstand being bombarded by electrons. Whereas light microscopy, um, we're just kind of limited by how big it is. Okay, so that's kind of a quick primer on um, maybe a week and a half worth of material in cell biology. But where this is leading to is trying to understand this, this relatively new, I would say like less than a decade old um, concept as super resolution microscopy. Um, this doesn't mean electron microscopy. That's been around for a long time. We know that, but super resolution, mi resolution microscopy, which is awarded the Nobel prize, I think in 2015, um, is a newer um, sort of concept idea. And we're gonna talk about that because I think it's really illustrative of this concept of airy disks and diffraction patterns. So I'm gonna show you this picture. This is where a liberal arts education comes into hand in, comes in handy. This is um, a, a painting by Lemin. It's the beach. And this is a type of, of uh, uh, painting, a, a type of style called pointillism. And so this image is made up of tiny paint strokes of different colors. It's really beautiful. Um, and from afar, you really can see that this is a beach sort of scene happening. But up close, if you got even closer, all you would see was hundreds of millions of little paintbrush strokes. And so what does this have to do with uh, electron, or what does it have to do with super resolution microscopy? Um, hopefully by the end of this next section, you'll, have, you'll understand where I'm coming from with that. Okay. So we're back to our airy disk, we're turning it on its side. And again, I'm giving this equation. The, the, re the radius of this uh, airy disk is defined by 0.61 lambda times numerical aperture. And that makes us have a um, limit of 200 and 250 nanometers. Um, and unfortunately, we're just talking about the uh, resolution in X and Y. If we go into Z, it's even worse. So it's 500 to 700 nanometers. So you really can't see things very deep into tissues. I'm a cell biologist, I don't have to go that deep into tissues, but other people who study development in organisms have to be able to go deep into tissues and the re resolution there is really crappy. So by conventional light microscopy. So how do we get around this? What are we, what are we doing to get around this? Okay, so now this is where it gets really mathy, but we can define X and Y location of the centroid, the very center of that airy disk with more precision, we could theoretically increase the resolution. So if we can find the very center of the airy disk with real high accuracy, we can start to increase and make that um, airy disk even smaller and smaller and smaller. Remember, our goal is to make that airy disk as small as possible. So how can we do this? So here again is, is what we call the airy disk. You can see it's spreading and it's there's a lot of fluff that's just not helping us really define that center of that airy disk. Um, so what we need to do is have a highly sensitive camera. 
we need to use a high contrast mode of imaging. Um, and one example of that is TERP, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and what we need to know um, is actually, I'm going to skip through this because it's all right. We don't actually need to know that much. Um, so what we can do is take advantage of a whole new class of fluorescent molecules that are photoconvertible. So this image series here is showing us that we have a cell that has a fluorescently tagged green protein that we can hit it with another laser, which converts that green fluorescent protein to red. So we're able to change a green fluorescent protein to a red fluorescent protein. And being able to convert from red to green is actually a really important key to understanding how we can do super resolution microscopy. So if you're with me, we have a green fluorescent molecule. We hit it actually with a 405 nanometer laser, which is blue, and it turns that green into red. So what we can do is take a field of, of fluorescent molecules that are not on, so they're dark, they're black to you and me, and then we can hit them with an activation beam, turning them on. But we don't wanna blast the entire field of molecules. We only wanna kind of hit a couple. So we sort, of met, we sort of decrease our sort of beam strength to only activate a few single molecules of fluorescent protein. Now that fluorescent protein is tagged to a structure. Say for my instance, I said the cytoskeleton, it might be tagged to a cytoskeletal protein but we're only activating single molecules of that fluorescently tagged uh, molecule, uh, protein. And then we have a second beam, a beam that is our readout beam. So we activate with one laser and then we can read out or get the fluorescence Im information with another laser. So we have two lasers, one to turn on and one to actually read the fluorescence. And what we do is we, measure all of the light coming from those individual molecules as much as we can. We capture all of the light that comes until they actually bleach. So they'll bleach. That means we've collected all the light that the molecule is now dead. And then we go back and do this again. So what we're doing is collecting all the light from individual fluorescent molecules over and over and over again. And what this does is allows us to fit a Gaussian distribution to these fluorescent molecules. And so the more um, information we get, the more light that we acquire from these single molecules, um, the, the more information that we're going to have and the better we can define the center of that airy disk. And so um, the, the more photos to capture, the more accuracy. So if we capture about a thousand photons, that's gonna give us a resolution of 10 nanometers. So we're gonna have a very good idea where the center of that airy disk is within 10 nanometers. And if we capture 10,000 photons, now we're talking about one to two nanometers. So this takes fluorescent conventional microscopy that usually has a resolution of 200 nanometers and now we've converted it to 10 or one to two nanometers. And so here's what an, a, a um, photoactivated localization microscopy or palm. This is the technique I've been describing. This is what it looks like. It is formed from thousands of airy disks reconstructed to form the image. And so now we're getting below the resolution of that 200 nanometer limit that we were talking about before. So um, what this means in terms of sizes, if we're looking at a single fluorescent molecule under conventional microscopy, it's gonna have a a uh, resolution of around 200 nanometers. Um, and, and in the Z, about 400. With some of these new um, super resolution microscopy techniques, that decreases to 25 nanometers in X and Y or, and 100 nanometers in the Z. So we've, we've, we've cut down a lot of the riffraff and have really localized, pinpointed the, central, the center of those airy disks that are gonna make up our image. Um, and then even with another technique that does a little bit more um, a little bit more math, we can actually get down to 20 nanometers in the XY and 10 nanometers in the Z. So I'll go back because I want you to think about this image. It is made up of tons of tiny little um, paintbrush stro strokes that isn't too different from this. So essentially super resolution microscopy 
is using pointillism on the micro scale to reconstruct images with tiny little points of light that become that allows us to go below the resolution of light we normally be um, controlled by by physics. So in a nutshell, and in you know five minutes, I just explained to you super resonant microscopy. Okay, so let me go back to where I was. Okay, great. Okay, so the last technique I wanna talk about is a technique that I regularly use in my lab, which is total internal reflection microscopy or TERF. Um, super resolution microscopy is great. Those microscopes cost about one to $2 million. I do not have one of those microscopes in my lab, um, but there is one at OHSU um, that I could use if I wanted to. Um, but what I do have in my lab and what I do um, uh, let my students loose on is my total internal reflection microscopy microscope or my turf microscope. And so um, the concept behind turf is actually is, is pretty simple if you think about it. Um, if you have a beautiful uh, diamond ring and you look at that beautiful diamond ring in the light, what you're looking at is this beautiful sparkle it looks like from that the diamond. And why we like that, it is obviously really pretty, but what's happening in there is that light is entering that diamond through the very facets that are, the diamond is cut to. And instead of reflecting off that diamond, it's actually being totally internally reflected inside the diamond. So it makes the diamond look as if it is glowing, when in fact, all what's happening is light is bouncing around being internally reflected inside the diamond. So that's the central concept between um, underneath that underlies total internal reflection microscopy. Um, and so it, it relies on that one of the, the principles we talked about way at the beginning of this talk, which was um, refraction or reflection. Um, and so when you have light coming from water to say air, some of that light will be refracted. But if you get to a angle, a critical angle, that light will be totally internally reflected. It would hit the interface between the air and the water. And instead of going through the sample, it's going to be totally internally reflected, much like the light that is totally internally reflected in the diamond. And we can actually control the angle. Um, in this case, when I use when I do turf microscopy, I'm actually using lasers, and I can control the angle of that laser so I can make it actually totally internal reflect off that interface between my cell sample um, and the laser and air. Okay. So here's what this kind of looks like. I'm able to use my aim my laser at a specific angle, and instead of completely penetrating into the sample. It is bouncing off this interface between the glass and the sample, and it's totally internally reflected. Um, what this results in is a, um, a leaking of the fluorescence into the sample. So the physicists can't fully explain this phenomenon, which I think is kind of interesting, because this laser is theoretically being totally internally reflected, there should be no leakage of the laser into the sample, yet there is. And that leakage is called the evanescent wave front. Um, it's not transmitted into the sample, okay. And what's really important is this decays exponentially. So what that looks like is that we can totally internally reflect the laser and only excite the molecules at the very bottom of, this, of the cover slope. So again, we have fluorescent labeled um, molecules floating around in the cell, but only a few of them at the very bottom of the cell are, is activated. And so it, 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 and because this, ex, this decays exponentially, the samples that are floating above are not being excited. And this is important because they're then not contributing to our image. We only are exciting those molecules really close to the interface, and those are the only ones that are contributing to the image. And that cuts down on noise. Noise is a problem, right? You're getting light from all different places. It's scattering and being reflected in different ways, and it's hard for us to actually identify where it's coming from. But with turf, we're actually cutting down on that noise, so there are only a few molecules that are being um, excited at a time. And so here would be an example of this. So we have on the left an epifluorescence image. And on the right, 
we're looking at these little structures at the bottom of the cell and you can see that they pop out and are really clear to see by turf microscopy. So that's why we use turf. It really helps us, um, it decreases the um, signal to noise ratio. Um, and another really handy thing is we can actually look at single molecules here. So we're actually looking at single molecules of a motor protein on a microtubule. The little lights are just these motor proteins walking along microtubules. So turf is just really great for the signal to noise ratio. It cuts down on the noise and allows us to really see those objects that are close to the cover slip interface really well. Okay, cool. So um, let's, so how, let's look at turf in action. Um, turf is the primary type of microscopy that I use in my lab. And so in my research lab, um, uh, I have, like I said before, I have a turf micros a microscope um, and I teach my students how to use it. Um, I have obviously thesis students, um, but also have summer research students. Um, and um, that's who's done primarily most of the work I'm about to share with you. So um, this is just a short tale about a project that's currently going on um, that's funded by the NIH in the lab. Um, and so um, Aiden Turan is a currently a post -bac, so he graduated last year, um, but I kept him on to help finish this project through. Um, JJ is a, actually he's a student at WSU Vancouver, but he volunteers part-time in my lab. Amy just left, she was a reedy, and she's now at the University of Washington getting her PhD. And Sushruta is a graduating senior this year. He's a biophysics major. So these are the people that have contributed to this project and who are working in my lab currently. Well, Amy is gone, but who are contributing to this project. Um, and so part of that title is this word, non-muscle myosin II contractility. So let's break that down first. So what does non-muscle myosin II do? Well, you are all currently using muscle myosin. Muscle myosin is what is in your muscles. It is what moves our bones, our face. It is what's keeping your, your body erect as you sit. It's what's um, helping your heart beat right now and your lungs breathe. That's what muscle myosin does. Cells, all of our cells, have a non-muscle version of this protein. And it's arguably probably evolutionarily older than the muscle version. Um, multicellular organisms take this non-muscle myosin too and kind of did some stuff to it to make us have actual muscles. But this older version is the non-muscle myosin II version. And so this is a very classic example of a cell dividing. So we see the cell starts as one and then it starts to divide into two. And in order to be able to split off into two, non-muscle myosin II is constricting at that center point, allowing the cells to split off. Um, this is another uh, developmental process in Drosophila. So the Drosophila has, is just a one giant ball of cells and we need to have internal cells to make organs, et cetera. And so what you're watching is those cells going inside the organism, invagination, and non-muscle myosin II is squeezing at the very apices of these cells, driving them into the organism. So again, non-muscle myosin II is, is needed for morphogenesis is what we call this. And then non-muscle myosin II is also really important for cell migration. So you're looking at a Drosophila cell that I've um, imaged here, and we're looking at non-muscle myosin II directly, and it looks kind of like fireworks in the sky, but these are these, these sporadic um, oligomerization of these non-muscle myosin II molecules. And this, this, this cell is actually using the non-muscle myosin II to pull on the cover slip as it, as it crawls. Um, and at its very basic, non-muscle myosin II is regulated by a post-translational event that we call phosphorylation. And so this is what we call the blobology portion of the talk. So this is a non-muscle myosin II molecule. Um, what happens is that it is phosphorylated on a specific set of residues that causes the molecule to open up. When the molecule opens up, it then teams up with other non-muscle myosin IIs to form oligomers that bind to the red stuff. And that red stuff is actin. So you can think of this as your bicep. You have your bone, and then you have myosin that's pulling on the bone. So when you go to flex, it's moving your, moving your arm and causing your arm to move. That's exactly what non-muscle myosin II is doing. Instead of binding to bone, it's binding to the structure called actin. As it pulls, it pulls on the actin and we get constriction. So this is what um, non-muscle myosin II looks like in um, S2 cells, these are the cells we use in the lab. And here I'm showing you actin in red and 
non-muscle myosin two as is in um, uh, in cyan. Um, and here is even a closer look of non-muscle myosin two. So remember, it's first in that closed conformation; it can't bind anything, and then it's activated and forms giant oligomers that then can bind things. And so that's what I think we're happening here. We're watching the assembly of non-muscle myosin two into larger structures that will then allow the cell to contract and pull on things. So a little bit of background, more background about this project. Um, I did a bioinformatic query um, and identified a previously uncharacterized Drosophila protein that had a specific domain. So I was really interested in this um, domain, which is just a little bit of a protein um, called the Calponin homology domain or CH domain. And I cloned, I cloned this protein, it's a fly protein and put it in fly cells and looked at its localization. Unbeknownst to me, um, so fly proteins, when they're not characterized, they're just give, given uh, a, the CG number, CG13366, just means that we've identified it as a protein, but we have no idea what it does. And so someone went through and sort of found all the proteins in the Drosophila genome and just gave them numbers. And then later on, people like me go through and research and figure out what they do. And so we didn't know what this protein did, did initially, um, but um, unbeknownst to me, it had a really interesting story associated with it because it had a human homolog, so a human version of this protein that, are really, that is um, involved in um, cranial facial disorders. So the human version, um, uh, when it's mutated in, in a couple families, it causes cranial facial disorders or um, wide clefts, wide eyes, and incomplete closure of the esophagus. So unfortunately, these families, there's a, a couple of them that identified, there's a mutant version of this SBECC1L, which is the same as the Drosophila protein I cloned um, called split disks. So split disks is, is SBECC1L. SBECC1L is a human version. Split disk is a fly version. They're really close. They're about um, 30 to 40% homologous. And so in humans, when SBCC1L is mutated, it causes all these facial deformities, including cleft palates. And obviously the cleft palates being probably one of the more milder um, repercussions of this mutant protein is still really costly to fix. Um, people have to go through, undergo a lot of painful surgeries, which costs thousands of dollars. It really detracts from someone's life. So trying to understand where this, these facial uh, deformities come from is kind of what's um, at the heart of this project. Um, so uh, it turns out that there's a population of cells called neural crust cells. These, these cells are present during development and as a de developing human um, starts to progress, um, they sort of move out from a specific spot in the developing embryo and these cells crawl and they make your face and draw structures. And so it turns out that if you have mutation to SBCC1L, this process is interrupted somehow. And then those cells can't get to the right place at the right time to form the facial structures resulting in facial clefts. Um, and so uh, we'll skip some of these slides. It's not that important. Um, so uh, in flies, like I said, there's a, there's a fly version of it. And oddly enough, when the fly version is mutated, we see similar phenotypes. Now here's, I have to make a disclaimer, flies don't have neural crust cells. That's only a mammalian um, thing. Flies do not have that. Insects don't have neural crust cells, but the phenotypes are very similar. We have issues with cell migration and adhesion. So that shows you that this protein is super important and it's conserved from flies to humans and it's doing something in terms of regulating um, cell migration and adhesion. And so when I put this protein in the cells, it localized in a pattern that was highly reminiscent of non-muscle myosin 2. So in my hands, I saw that split disks, the fly version of this SBCC1L, and non-muscle myosin 2 co-localize. That is not what the, um, the uh, authors of that first paper saw in human cells. So the question is, if these proteins are really um, highly homologous, why are we seeing different localization patterns in humans versus flies? Um, so here is a uh, image sequence of split disks and non-muscle myosin 2 and S2 cells. 
split disc is in red, non-muscle myosin 2 is in cyan. And again, we see that the dynamics of these proteins are very similar. And also this is just really pretty to look at. And if we um, start to mess with some of the proteins that are really important for non-muscle myosin 2 assembly, now remember here we see beautiful patches of non-muscle myosin 2 in the center of the cell. If we get rid of one of these essential light chains, part of the non-muscle myosin molecule, those patches kind of look like they got blown up in the cell. But oddly enough, split disc also localizes with these blown up molecules. And so the question I was trying, I'm trying to ask, answer with my students is how does split disc co-localize with non-muscle myosin 2? Because we don't know. What is the mechanism? How does it do it? And so we did a very classic um, approach. We took a structure function approach to look at that. And we use microscopy to do it. So we have a way to measure how uh, we have a way to measure how uh, closely two proteins co-localize together. I um, mean, that's essentially what's happening here. The, the actual measure is called matters of overlap coefficient, but I won't go through the details of that. But it's a way for us to measure how closely two proteins co-localize in a cell, mathematically, basically. Um, and so here again, we're looking at um, split disks and non-muscle myosin 2. And remember back at the beginning of the blobology portion, I showed you that non-muscle myosin 2 is either a closed conformation where it can't bind to actin and then an open conformation where it's open and can bind actin. The first question we want to know, does split disk differentially localize with a closed myosin that's not binding actin or an open myosin that is binding to actin? Um, and so we actually co-transfected both molecules into the cell. We have a mutant version of, of non-muscle myosin 2 that can't be phosphorylated, therefore can't open up and bind to actin. We have a mutant version of non-muscle myosin 2 that is always phosphorylated, therefore always on, always open. And so we have two different states, on and off. And we just wanted to know, does split disk localize with the on state or the off state? And this is why it's really important to use math and a lot of quant quantification, because by our eyes, it looks as if they all equally co-localize the same. But when you look at a whole bunch of samples of cells and you start to measure and look by math, you then begin to see differences. And so what we see is that there's a slight reduction in the amount of split disc overlapping with the non-phosphorylatable form of non-muscle myosin 2. That's what this graph is saying. So split disc has a slight preference for the open active non-muscle myosin 2 and not the closed one, which makes sense. That wasn't a, that's not a revolutionary finding. It totally makes sense biologically, but just because it makes sense, we have to actually prove it, right? So that's what we did. Um, so split disks also has a whole bunch of domains. There's just like uh, sort of portions of the molecule that we kind of know what it does. And so what we started to do is start to chop up that molecule under structure function L. This is a very common, um, common uh, uh, way to, to look at protein localization. So we started to cut up split disks in different, um, uh, different domains and looked at the degree of which split disc co-localizes with non-muscle myosin 2. And here I'm just showing you a deletion of the first sort of domain, this coiled coil domain is what it's called, the CC1. We get rid of CC1, the protein localizes just fine. We cut up also CC1 and CC2. These are coiled coil domains um, and they help this molecule what we think dimerize to form a pair. Um, and actually we can delete up to the second coiled coil domain and still see pretty good co-localization. However, if we delete the calponin homology domain, which is that CH domain at the very end terminus, it's what's here in purple, um, now we lose co-localization. So we transfect it in a form of, of split disk that doesn't have that CH domain, and now we don't see co-localization at all, which is, which is interesting. So you can get rid of the coiled coil domains, which make up the middle of this molecule, and it's fine. But if you get rid of that CH domain, which is the very um, C terminus of this molecule, now we lose co-localization. So this is telling us that, that CH domain is really important for split disc to co-localize with non-muscle myosin 2. And that's, that's shown here. We quantified the co-localization here. And you can see um, in the uh, graph with the green, the column with the green um, dots, that we see a huge decrease in the amount of co-localization when we get rid of that CH domain. Um, however, 
if we just express just that CH domain and nothing else, we see no co-localization whatsoever with myosin. So this is why we think that um, uh, split disc is a dimer. Many proteins that have CH domains have them in, in pairs. And as you can see here, there's only one CH domain. And so what we think is that split disc operates as a dimer because this result tells us that expression of just the CH domain alone is not enough to co-localize to non-muscle myosin two. Um, and so the final question that we wanted to address is um, what do this disease causing variants do to split dislocalization? Now, remember, we started this talking about these poor people, unfortunately, who have facial cranial deformities because of um, defects, because of mutations to split discs. And so we're able to put in the same exact mutations that are found in people with these cranial facial disorders and look and see how does this affect the protein localization. So in the middle, I'm showing you one is this um, mutation, this Q266P is a mutation of, of glutamine to proline. And another one is a glycine to serine mutation. And again, these mutations are found in, in, in people, unfortunately, that have disorders. And now we looked at their, um, the amount of co-localization. And again, this is again why we need math and um, quantification because by eye, they look very similar to wild type, which is in the, the left. But when we look at them, when we look at um, quantification after we look at a whole bunch of samples, we start to see differences. What you'll see is the cyan um, graph in the middle actually is showing an increase in co-localization. It's above the red bar, whereas the purple, um, that's the G915S, is actually below. So this is telling us that these mutations are actually affecting the ability of split disc to co-localize with non-muscle myosin two. The Q26P mutation showed an increase in co-localization, whereas the G915S mutation showed a decrease. So that might tell us something about how split disc is functioning in terms of cell migration and forming facial cranial structures in the end. So there's just a slight preference for the Q266P mutation to co-localize with non-muscle myosin two, Whereas there's a decrease in the G915 um, mutation to the colocas with non-muscle myosin too. Okay, so um, what I just showed you briefly um, is that split disc may have a slight preference for the open conformation of non-muscle myosin two. So when non-muscle myosin two is in the open conformation and able to bind actin and do its job, split disc likes to prefers to bind to that version of non-muscle myosin two. Um, and we're follow following up pharmacological manipulations, just means that we can use a whole bunch of drugs that actually affect non-muscle myosin two function, and we'll look at how split discs um, responds to those those drugs. Um, if we delete that C terminal CH domain, um, we lose co-localization of split discs with non-muscle myosin two, um, and then we looked again at these mutations. Um, G915S appears to decrease the amount of co-localization, whereas Q266P. Um, may enhance co-localization. Um, and finally, if we express just the CH domain alone, it does not co-localize with non-muscle myosin 2. So what does this tell us about non-muscle myosin 2 function and split discs? I don't know yet. <laughs> I've just told you about co-localization. Um, we're carrying on functional assays in the lab now because now we know there's differences in the way that split disc co-localize, but now we need to know what it's doing functionally. And that again is still a really big open um, unknown question that we're, we're currently tackling in the lab. So that's, that's kind of the next stage of our research in the lab. Um, and so this is the crew, this was taken last, I think December <laughs> before the world changed forever. <laughs> um, so obviously we were, we're um, um, having some pizza and beer up the, up the road at um, Double Mountain. Um, and then I just wanna thank everyone who's done the work um, uh, most of these students are um, Reed students that are either currently in my lab or who have graduated recently. Um, I've also collaborated with Peter Bar Gillespie at OHSU, and he is a Reed himself. Um, and then Greta Glover um, is works in the department. She's our, our departmental instrument, instrumentalist. She's given me a lot of support with my microscopes and other um, instruments that we needed for this project. And like I said before, this project is funded by the National Institutes of Health. I have another project going on in the lab, which I didn't talk about, that's funded by the National Science Foundation. And of course, um, Reed College gave me a generous um, startup package, allowed me to get my lab up and running. So um, I would be happy to take questions at this moment. 
Well, that's wonderful. I've compiled them uh, while, while you've been giving your wonderful presentation. So um, I'll go through them now. And if you have to leave, uh, Derek, let okay. us know. Um, but we'll see how many we can get through. OK, great. So the first one is, is there a sort of Heisenberg principle regarding how well you can be focused in an airy disk? Ooh, I would have to know what the Heisenberg principle is, and I do not. <laughs> so I, um, so if someone knows who that, what someone wants to, to explain to me that, I would certainly like to talk about it. But uh, um, I'm a cell biologist that dabbles in physics. So does someone want to tell me what that is? I'm not yet. Yeah, so like quantum uncertainty. Quantum uncertainty. Oh, okay. Um, I would say, well, there is a little bit of quantum uncertainty only because light can't be ablated, right? So um, if we talk about the wave particle theory of light, um, you know, when light waves um, are in the same, are in phase, they're additive. And when they're not in phase, they're theoretically destructive. But the really weird thing about light is you can't completely destroy it. And that's something that we're trying to, under I think physicists are also trying to understand is like, why, why can't you destroy light? And what happens is it gets shuttled in different ways. But in terms of how sharp and how, how um, small that um, airy disk can be, I don't know that we've applied, that people have thought about that applied that principle to um, that because it's not quite, we're not quite at quantum, um, at the quantum level here with light, with photons. But I would certainly refer to my physicist uh, colleagues if we really want to know that answer. <laughs> How much do you need to know about the chemistry of the particular structure within the cell that you're imaging to choose an appropriate fluorescent dye for it? That is a really excellent question. I think early on when we started to use fluorescent dyes and fluorescent proteins, um, there was a lot of worry about how much these proteins would be, um, their, their dynamics and their behavior would be changed by them. And so people did a lot of experiments to figure out exactly how and where to tag these proteins. Um, now it's so common um, that people don't stress about that too much anymore. Um, what is what would be the most thorough uh, way to test these ideas? So the answer is we, we we used to have to we used to felt like we need to know a lot, but what we found was that when we tagged these proteins with DFP or um, tagged them with fluorescent dyes or whatever, um, and then we actually stained with antibodies, the patterns were the same. And so what that was telling us is that the GFP molecule wasn't perturbing the protein too much. Um, now, of course, there is a little bit of perturbation and some proteins are more sensitive than others, but um, we've stopped worrying so much about the specific place where we tagged and therefore the specific chemistry where we tagged because for the most part, GFP seems to be an innocuous um, addition to the protein. All right. Is this evanescent wave on the other side of the water-air interface similar to a laser plasmon field phenomenon used in SIRS? Laser plasmon phenomenon used in SIRS. Um, I'm going to go on a ledge and say no. Um, really what it is is a leakiness that happens when the when laser is fully refracted. Um, reflected, I should say, not refracted, excuse me, reflected. Um, but I don't know that it's similar to that plasmid um, that happens in SIRS. I, I just know that um, the light doesn't actually transmit to the sample. And it's just a weird leaky phenomenon that happens when lasers are, are reflected. Yeah. All right. Where the fluorescent molecules were walking along the microtubules, what type of cell was being used and what was physiologically going on? Oh, that's a great question. So there were no cells being used. That was a complete in vitro experiment. So we were able to purify tubulin, put it down on a cover slip, then purify dynein and put that on the tubulin. So there was no membrane. It was a full cell-free um, purified protein um, preparation. I did not do that. That was um, a colleague, uh, Sam Rick Peterson at University of San Diego um, who did those experiments. Yeah. Are there motor proteins that operate on fibers other than microtubules? Yes. So myosin, which I was the star of the show, does operate on actin. Um, so myosin binds to actin. There are two other motor proteins, kinesin and dynein, that bind to microtubules. Um, and that's it. Those are the three classes of motor proteins that we know so far. Myosin, kinesin, and dynein. There might be others um, that we haven't identified, 
I would be surprised since it's been so many years, but um, those are the only three motor proteins we know of right now. All right, and last question. What timing differences exist for the expression of the gene in fly versus human development? That is a excellent question. Um, and I can only partially answer that because I only kind of know what happens in flies and I'm not entirely sure what happens in humans. Um, in flies, they are, it, it, that protein is um, highly expressed in the central nervous system of early developing, neuro, um, early developing embryos and highly expressed in the ovaries before they even become fertilized um, by the sperm. So those are the two places where there's really high expression. Um, but in humans, I don't know exactly where, when and where. Um, I'm not so deep into that literature. It's a great question. These were some of the toughest questions I have received. I just wanted to know that. <laughs> All right, I'll hand things back over to you, Barbara. Oh, I think you're muted. No, I'm unmuted. Okay, thank you very, very much, Derek. We really appreciate it. As you can tell from the questions, you had some people who knew what you were talking about, and then there were the rest of us. But I did learn two wonderful things that I can't wait to use. One is the word blobology. <laughs> and the other one is the concept of dismissing something as, oh, it's just a centroid of an airy disc. <laughs> <laughs> my, my apologies. <laughs> Don't apologize. I think those are wonderful, wonderful <laughs> words to use. I do think, however, that rather than attempting to come back into physics, I will just stick with being a naturalist. That sounds, anyway. <laughs> physics does, it does kind of sneak in. You kind of think you could forget about those classes, but they sneak up on you. I believe you, <laughs> except I've been doing something else for a long time. Now. <laughs> Thank you to all of you for joining us for our second virtual Fox and Schultz Club lecture. There will be a Foster Schultz virtual event happen during the reunions week in June. So please watch for more information about that in coming weeks. And look for an event survey that the Alumni Programs Office will email you tomorrow and answer it and return it. Thank you. And with that, we will say goodbye to Derek. And if anyone would stay online a bit longer, we can share some informal hangout time. Thank you very much for having me. It was my pleasure. So thank you.